good view from the other side of the industry outside the hospitals, important to know and to connect. We move next to the Middle East, to uh, Beirut, Lebanon, to a friend, Riyad Farah. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Yadin. Thank you, Tom, Kaliroy. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, back to the hospital, uh, hospital line, front line, just like our friend Umberto, just sharing some information from the um, practical uh, hospital expertise and the lessons that we learned and the challenges that we faced. Definitely uh, working with COVID patient uh, has changed how the hospital used to, uh, to service. Uh, definitely COVID has changed our lives as well. Uh, Riyad, show your uh, video of, of yourself if you can. If not, keep uh, going, thanks. I'm sorry, Tom, I don't have a camera. No problem, keep going, brother. All right, thanks. Well, unlucky, uh, we in Lebanon, we had a financial crisis a couple of months before the corona, so it helped, it added up to the problem with the shortages of supplies, and that, that was very, uh, very tough on the hospitals uh, on all fronts. For the lessons learned, um, well, there are some points regarding the hospital leadership and decision making. Uh, another lesson was in the training and the importance of training. And the third lesson was on the stock and availability of enough stock. Uh, definitely clinical engineers should participate in decision making process uh, not only just repairing the equipment, like Adriana said, uh, the hospital leadership uh, must be ready and be flexible to adapt fast to a crisis because the crisis shall not wait for anyone to get ready. Um, that we changed how the hospital works day by day. Uh, we stopped. Sorry, the we closed all entrances except few just control them with uh, with non-contact thermometers just to um, as a front line clean everybody put face masks we closed the dining rooms dining areas and delivered food to the working force we closed all outside uh, uh, outpatient clinics uh, so that to reduce cross-contamination and we reduced the unnecessary staff to half on two rotations um, the second point was the importance of the drills and the training. Although we had everything uh, ready in documentation and everybody was planned ahead of time, yet the training and drill is very important. Uh, we had the incident command center, just like what WHO recommendations for emergency preparedness. And we, have, we had one contact person for the media. And the normal decision-making process has shifted from the normal process which was used to be done with the executive committee in the hospital to the uh, ICG. Um, this offered a faster decision process. Um, we had the representative from the medical officer, safety officer, administrative and finance, and clinical engineering. And it was very important how we relay information to each other because honestly, information, there is always uh, an issue with communication somewhere. And the importance of drawing the responsibilities is was so crucial because uh, when the crisis arrives uh, responsibilities try to fly from one person to the other uh, practically on on the ground uh, things must be very well uh, prepared and training done on it uh, we had some protocols preset and uh, everything was clear for the reception, triage, screening, admission, treatment, isolation, and discharge. But unfortunately, at the beginning, we were bombarded with contradictory information, uh, and the social media helped a lot with the contradictory information. For example, the use of masks in areas, uh, supporting areas, not in direct contact with the COVID patients, and the connection of getting prepared to connect the ventilator with several patients. Um, all of these helped add it up to the, uh, let's say, a bit chaotic uh, preparedness. And the third uh, message learned uh, is the stock. We, uh, 
most hospitals, if not all, they try to use the just on time stocking system and they rely on the supply chain, which is okay on normal days. But we understand that just on time stocking system shall not work at the time of crisis. And obviously no one knows when the crisis comes. So let's ask ourselves a question. Um, what if we increase our stock of necessary items for life-saving materials? Of course, respecting the hospital cash flow, not losing uh, items on expiration dates, expired items. Definitely this makes us much easier and much, much readier. Um, these are important thing because having stock uh, for life safety uh, items and uh, parts for ventilators and life saving equipment is crucial for the uh, daily work. Okay. And for the challenges, uh, some three challenges we faced was, it's very important to have a national plan because one hospital cannot serve the whole community. Uh, it's very important so that hospital, they can work hand in hand. Uh, national plan is important. Cooperation is very important. Uh, national committee to overlook the certification of local manufacturers. Definitely use what the WHO has issued. And uh, IFMBE played an important role to share these valuable information. But uh, it's very important to get prepared on the national uh, level as well. Another challenge was the architectural, architectural readiness. Although some hospitals, they were designed on the proper standards, but nevertheless to uh, allocate a separate building for isolation well, is not easy. And uh, we always have limited spaces, especially with the hospitals that are built in, 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 in big cities. And we are not always ready for the increased surge capacity due to physical location. So the coordination between doctors and administration is important and the shortage in supplies of masks, gloves, safety items is, is also was a big challenge. I hope with this information, I participated in, in elevating the readiness of clinical engineer all over the world. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Riyadh. It's very thank important you. to make the note, uh, Riyadh, like you said, is that we need to increase our readiness our readiness next time around. You're absolutely right. Architecturally and equipment. Next, we're moving to Africa, both Central and South Africa. Meladen, Oluta, and Ashnafi Hussein. We'll start with Meladen. And Meladen, there are questions coming to the panel about what are the standards to uh, manage the uh, rapid production of variety of ventilators in small manufacturing site. Can you, can you address that? Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yes. So uh, this is a very contentious issue now um, because there are two national projects that have been launched. One by um, government departments that are finally talking to one another um, and they've launched the National Ventilator Project which it's a misnomer because it actually is focusing on, on CPAP. And then there's a private sector initiative, the South African Emergency Ventilator Project, which is focused on re-engineering the Penlon Nuffield 200, which is a basic, simple mechanical ventilator, which in the opinion of the project team will do the job. Um, they've got an, and, and they brought in the state-owned enterprises, uh, including our arms manufacturer, Donnell, um, and they've got, they've got uh, people that are highly skilled, but not in the medical um, device uh, sector um, and industry. Um, and they are planning to commence manufacture within a couple of weeks. Um, and to your point, there's been a whole parallel discussion on the, on the governance, the due diligence and the regular oversight that needs to be provided. And to cut a long story short, my recommendation and our recommendation sitting on both sides of the fence um, has been that this is overly ambitious, um, that the unintended consequences haven't been properly thought through, that it, it's, it's a rigorous process. And, and even if one 
complies with the minimum requirements in terms of international standards, it is still a, a medium term project talking one, one year conservatively um, compared to something that can be rolled off production line with, within a month. So that's been our recommendation. The unintended consequence um, is that although one is one applauds uh, the collective energy and, um, and application of skills from other sectors, the unintended consequence is that if, God forbid, um, this device is introduced uh, in, in significant numbers and patients are injured, um, as a result, um, there, will be, there will be significant medical legal consequences. But I think more to the point in terms of ventilation, the statistics have come in and it's predicted that this will apply in South Africa too, that more than 50% of patients who go into ventilation actually do not make it, they pass away. So it'll only be a, a matter of time before the uh, litigation lawyers uh, get onto this uh, and you can bet your bottom dollar that they will convince uh, families of loved ones who have lost their lives while on ventilation to institute a class action suit to, uh, to claim against government um, to the effect that their loved ones passed away because a ventilator that did not pass proper due diligence in terms of regulatory compliance was used on their, on their loved one and, and was responsible for their demise. So it's a very important, um, in fact, a, a vital, vital discussion. And I applaud the work that is being done um, in India. Um, and, and I wish that we could, uh, ha, you know, have that same guidance and energy and capability, but we don't. And so we are very concerned, um, especially since, for example, in the Western Cape, uh, and I speak for our department, we've been able to procure um, 100 additional ventilators and our critical care forum um, is of the pin that we will not be able to cope with many more simply because of the staffing available. 